to preach some messages on the Bible, on the Word of God. And uh, here in chapter 4 of Matthew, verse 1, it says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was hungered. He was afterward and hungered. And uh, when the, the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live uh, by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In this temptation, our Lord is tempted to satisfy his humanity uh, by turning rocks into bread. Now, do you say you believe Jesus could do it? Well, if he could turn water to wine, he can turn rocks to bread. And I have absolutely no problem in believing that Jesus Christ can do it. And I, uh, I'm not sure, but what he won't do it uh, in the tribulation. But uh, <clears throat> the reason you and I uh, find it so difficult to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is because we're ignorant of most of it. You can't live by that which you don't know. And uh, so we rob ourselves of much good by refusing to read all of the Bible and to meditate upon God's Word. Jesus was never at a loss in answering His critics or to resolve the will of God. He had no problem with it. He knew that the words of His Father, that they were spirit and they were life. And that's why He could say, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now there are some obvious prerequisites. First of all, you must know for sure that you have every word of God. And uh, most of these modern Bibles take words out of the Word of God. Uh, I, uh, I hope to bring to this pulpit a list, a, a list of about 20 verses, which is just a small list, of verses that have been taken out of the uh, out of the King James, and you read the, or out of the NIV. Matter of fact, the NIV is probably the most dangerous Bible you could have. Right. And uh, uh, you, you folks, bless your heart. Uh, I know you buy it because you want to understand the Bible. I know your heart's not wicked in buying it. I don't not even I'm not even implying that. I don't believe you go out and buy a Bible because, for a wicked motive. I don't think that. And I don't think you're a bad person, and I'm not trying to embarrass you or intimidate you. It's the last thing I want to do. But I do want you to know the issue, and the issue always is around God's Word. The Bible is the issue. The Bible says, if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And I'm telling you, the foundation is being destroyed, but the thing is, it's being destroyed a brick at a time. The whole building is not being blown down. That would be too obvious. What is happening is a brick at a time is being removed, and those bricks have to do with two things. In every case, they'll have to do with the deity of Christ and the plan of salvation. I promise you, and I'll show you uh, if the Lord uh, allows uh, in the days ahead. Now then, <clears throat> um, I want you to notice, first of all, the temptation in this text. You'll notice in verse 3, it says, And when the tempter came to him, he said... If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Now there is no question in the devil's mind about who Jesus Christ was. He was not questioning whether Jesus Christ was the Son of God. In fact, what he's doing is saying, since you are the Son of God, do this. Now the, the word if many times in the Bible does not imply doubt. The word if may be a word of certainty. It would be like, uh, uh, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Well, there's no question that saved people are risen with Christ. And so the if there is not a matter of doubt. Uh, he's not questioning the deity of Christ. He's tempting him to do something else. 
Now you'll notice the time of this temptation because you read in verse 1 that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. It was the Holy Spirit of God that led Jesus Christ into the wilderness and there to be tested. Now when Adam and Eve were created, they were put in a garden. And Adam and Eve were given all the need, all the things they needed, but there was one probation or uh, one uh, uh, thing that they were not allowed to do. They were allowed to do almost anything else, but he says, when you eat of this tree, you will die. And that tree was there so that man could have a free will. Even man in his perfect condition had a free will. And he had all the trees that were good for food. He had all the trees that were beautiful for sight. I mean, everything the eye could desire that uh, righteously so was there. All the physical needs were met. Then there was a tree of life so that his physical life could be sustained forever by his coming to this tree. And then there was one other tree and it was a forbidden tree. And now if that tree had not been there, had there been no uh, point of testing, then mankind means nothing. You need to realize that. Because folks sometimes ask the question, well why, did the, why the devil and why sin and why all of this? God created man with a free will. And uh, God never uh, enticed man to sin. Matter of fact, he told him, he said, in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. So you have a free will. Well, you really don't have a free will now because your, your will and my will has been corrupted and our wills have been brought under bondage. So to say that we have an absolute free will today is not true. But Adam and Eve did have. They had an absolute free will and they, they could have chosen to not sin. You are going to sin. There's no excuse for it, but you're going to. All right? So the time of this temptation, uh, notice that Jesus is led up into the wilderness. And the reason for this temptation at this point is because Christ is man. He's the son of man while he's here. He is the son of man. And our Lord is operating as the son of man being subject to God. Even though he's deity, he's operating as the son of man. And uh, he must be tempted because he is the second Adam. He must be tested. A man, a man has a right to the throne who has, uh, who has earned it. And Jesus Christ was tested to show that he not only had, that he had a right, a moral right to the throne. He not only had a right by birth, but he had a right because that he stood against the devil. Now Adam and Eve did not stand against the devil in the garden, but Jesus stood against the devil in the wilderness. And you'll notice that the time of this temptation was while he was in the will of God. The Bible says he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. Now <clears throat> when the Bible says lead us not into temptation, that is in the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation. That is a tribulation Jew praying that they will be delivered from persecution. Some folks think, well, God doesn't lead you into, into testing. Oh, yes, God does, you see. And God may lead you into some serious trouble. The prayer was, lead us not into temptation. And the temptation there had to do with, uh, with, with, with great suffering that will be going on in the tribulation. When Jesus said pray this prayer, he's not telling the church to pray that prayer. This is a prayer that the Jews will pray in the tribulation period. The Apostle Paul talked about being with a particular church. And he said, the temptation in my flesh you despised not. Well, Paul is not talking about a carnal temptation that these people uh, allowed or condoned. He's talking about some infirmity in his flesh. And it perhaps it was an infirmity of the eyes to where he prayed three times for this affliction to be removed. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient. But I challenge you, Paul said, but the temptation that was in my flesh, you despised not. So God 
does lead his children into periods of testing. And sometimes those testings uh, can lead, if, if we yield to them, they can lead to great destruction. The garden, the, the, the tree of life in the garden was a place of testing. That's why it was there. Don't you realize your Christian life means nothing without testing? Amen. It means nothing. The way we are strengthened is by testing. The way we get to know ourselves is by testing. Uh, you hear so much, you know, uh, most of us are becoming so uh, illiterate nowadays that they're trying to remove testing from the schools. Well, if you could just remove testing, kids wouldn't fail. You see, I mean, that's the idea today. You can't raise the standard. You just take the standard away. I mean, it would be like this, you know, somebody said the other day, you know, if you legalize drugs, the crime rate would go down about 30%. Well, it would. The crime rate would, but drug addiction would probably go up 100%. So folks get the idea, they get these statistics, you know, if you can just remove the law, then the crime rate will be gone. Sure it will. Sure it will. You re, you, it's no longer illegal. So what you do to do away with failing is you take away the test. And then failure is never marked. And so God's people need to realize that you and I are constantly brought into situations to where we are being tested. And it may be a death in the family. It may be the loss of a job. It can be somebody that just kind of... <laughs> just kind of clabbers your milk, you know, somebody that just you just can't stand that God brings into your life. Have you ever had any? I have. But I knew it wasn't God. That had to be the devil, right? It's about the way you and I think, you see. But God brings events and people into our life to test us. To test us. And boy, I have a hard time with that. You know why I have a hard time with it? Because I don't know when it's happening. I usually mess it up and then figure it out. And then what do I do? I have to go back and apologize to the guy. You know, God, I'm so stupid. Why don't you tell me before you do this? See? So Adam and Eve had a testing, had a test in the garden. And they failed. They were representatives of the human race. Here comes the next representative of the human race. He must have testing. But rather than being tested in almost a perfect environment, he is out here in the wilderness, alone, hungry, and thirsty, and by himself, and the devil shows up. That's what the devil does, you know, when, uh, when God is working in your life, the devil is right there. Right. Most folks, you know, the most difficult thing in the world to figure out is if God's working on you or if the devil's working on you. It really is. I haven't figured that out. I really don't. You know what? When I feel like quitting, I don't know if the devil is tempting me to quit or if God's trying to get me to move on. And how to figure that out, I've never figured it out. I can't figure it out. You know, there are pastors that are so spiritual. I mean, they can pick your mate for you and they can tell you which house to buy and what car to buy and what color to paint your car. I've never been that spiritual. Somebody said, well, God just had the right person for you. Maybe. I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know those things. I don't know those things. And you don't know them either. You don't know those things. See? So the most difficult thing is when you're in this kind of a situation is to figure it out. And I, I don't know. I guess this, you just have to do this all yourself. I mean, w would you think... <laughs> If you were in Job's situation and you had never read the book of Job, you'd never think God was in that situation. You wouldn't think God was in it. But you've read the book of Job. You know. But Job, he didn't know. See? And before it's over with, Job's really an upset fellow. He really is. He just says, hey, everybody's picking on me, including God. See? And so here the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, is in the wilderness being tested as a man. And uh, this temptation, this testing, he is going to prove that he is the worthy representative of men and women. That he is the second Adam. Now to notice the time of it, I mentioned the time of it. It's when Jesus was led up. 
The second thing, it's in the wilderness. And there is usually where the devil finds you. Uh, in the wilderness when, uh, when you're all alone and things, uh, you know, you kind of wonder what else could happen. When it rains, it pours. Uh, Larry Hogarth told me, <laughs> I think it's funny. He told me the other day, he said, all three cars are broken down at the same time. I'm just glad to know somebody else has car trouble, Larry. I mean, you know, I thought I was the only one. And, uh, but the transmission was out and several other things, you know, and I'm not glad it happened to you, not really. But, you know, I'm, my point is it just, it just makes a good illustration. You see, when it rains, it pours. You see, matter of fact, your husband talking about raining. Uh, I understand the tie rod went out from under his car the other day and he shot across the oncoming traffic and wound up on the other side of the freeway or something, right? Yeah. Up in the mountains somewhere. And then today, I guess you had some more car problems and they're at home working on a car, I guess. Yeah, so, so you know what I'm talking about. When it rains, it pours. And, and the devil seems, you know, God may be testing and teaching in those situations, but I guarantee you the devil's right behind your shoulder to take advantage of it. Right. That's my point. So we look at this and we say, well, is God doing this or is the devil? Hey, maybe both. Maybe both. I mean, here the Lord is working in the temptation, but there the devil's right there. And I am convinced that's the way it works. You preach a sermon, you know, you preach a sermon and people get saved and God blesses and somebody comes up and says, my, that was a great sermon. And you know what your, your response in your mind is? It sure was, wasn't it? And then, the, 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 you see, that's the devil. That's not the Holy Spirit prompting the preacher to say it sure was. It, it isn't, you see. The nature of this temptation was when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Hey, I must confess that I've never fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Neither have you. Right? Right? I tried four days and four nights once. I made it. Forty days and forty nights. That's a long time. That's a long time without food. Forty days and forty nights. I would imagine that if a guy used all that food time for prayer time and meditation, he could really get close to God, wouldn't you? Well, of course. And you know, once you start, you, you have fasted like beyond three or four days, you start getting all the poisons out of your system. You see, and you, it's, there's, there's really a transformation that takes place in your whole body. And the mind gets cleared up, and the, the faculties and the senses are, are keen. Now, there's many dangers during that time. Did you know that most, most cult and occultists, they, they practice fasting because of the, what it does, it clears the mind. And, uh, so while Jesus is fasting and praying and spending that time in the wilderness, the devil is right there. And notice what he does. He goes after his weakness. He said, if you be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. The question then, he, first of all, he questions God's love. If you be the Son of God, <clears throat> if God loved you, uh, if God loved you, uh, then uh, there won't be any problem with you fulfilling your needs this way. And he did this with Eve. The implication, notice when he said, hath God said. When the devil said to Eve, hath God said. That is like a kid saying to another kid. You mean to tell me your parents won't let you? Do you hear the implication in that, con in that statement? You mean your mom and dad won't let you? What kind of folks do you have? Are they over 40? <laughs> See? See, the implication there is that your parents are unfair. And that's the very thing Eve was asked by the devil. Hath God said? Which means that God is not fair. And God doesn't love you if he doesn't allow you. And so, if you be the Son of God, if you be God's Son, God loves you and He would allow you this liberty. And uh, He did that with the children of Israel in the wilderness. 
and he suggests it here with this temptation. Do you know that when you and I sin, we always justify it? And you know how you justify it? I needed it. I mean, that word need is overworked so much. I need this. I need that. I need. What we really mean is I want this. I want that. You see? And we've got the words mixed up. You know why we say I need it? Because that justifies doing it or having it. I really needed that. <laughs> you know. I guess I bought every gadget. I love gadgets. I really do. I love, that's why I like James Bond. I love gadgets. I always wanted a ballpoint pen. I could just go and blow them away. Here, here. I had one of those battery operated Rolodexes one time. You just push a button and that thing would just whiz. One time I couldn't get it stopped. like a fan. Just going and going. Some guy came in. He did it. I never thought about this, to tell you the truth, until this guy said it. He said, you got more gadgets than James Bond. I love gadgets. You know. And I don't need any of them. But I like them. I just like their toys. And I'm a boy, a little kid. You see? But the way you justify everything is say what? I need it. My, what an opportunity for Jesus Christ to justify turning the stones to bread. He legitimately needed it. Forty days without food. He could have said, I really need this. Couldn't he? And he would have been right, wouldn't he? Why, sure. That means it's never right to do wrong. Even when it's legitimate. It's still not right to do wrong. You see. But I guarantee you, we justify it. We justify it. I needed it. I need it. I went out and did it. Because, but you've got to convince yourself you need it first. Do you ever notice a guy gets ready to buy a car? He will spend hours talking himself into it by bad-mouthing the one he's got. Oh, it's not repairable. It's got 150,000 miles on it. Not only that, the heater doesn't work. The air conditioning doesn't work. The windshield wipers don't work. I, you know, and on and on we go. We've got, why? We've got to convince ourselves. You say, do you do that? Of course I do. Of course I do. We all do it. We all do it. And that's exactly how we get in trouble. I would rather badmouth my car to justify getting another than praying about it. Because I'm afraid to pray about it, afraid God will say no. Say, aren't you? Why, sure. Why pray about something if you want it? Just justify it by saying, I need it. And I believe that this is the temptation here. Uh, he questions God's love. He also questions the subjection of Jesus Christ to the Father. Why, he's implying. Notice what the devil is doing, that dirty rascal. He comes to the Son of God and says, If you be the Son of God, take matters into your own hands and save your life. And he had the audacity to think that Jesus Christ might do it. Now the devil is no fool when he deals with you or me. I guarantee you, you and I are no match for the devil. I mean, if Jesus prayed for Simon Peter... He said, I've prayed for you, Peter, that your faith fail not because the devil hath desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. And brother, when the devil's through with you, you're sifted. You're turned into flour. I guarantee you. God has never turned the devil loose on you and me. Like, you want to see it? Look at Job. Now, you want to see it? He just hasn't turned the devil. If he turned the devil loose on you, you'd be destroyed in a week. You would. How'd you like to get out of church tonight and, and hear that your wife and all your kids burn up in the house at home? Why, that'd be horrible, wouldn't it? And then you come to the church for sympathy and we all said, well, you must not be tithing or it wouldn't have happened. Well, that's what Job's friends said. Why, he said, search and see if any righteous people ever suffered. <laughs> How's that for encouragement? That's exactly what goes on. When it comes to you and me, the devil is no fool. I guarantee you. But when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, he is a fool. He really is. He is so deluded 
that he failed to realize that the one, to, the one that he was speaking to was subject to the Father. In John 8, 29, Jesus said, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? That's what Jesus said. I do always those things that please Him. You and I really can't say that. We can say it, but it wouldn't be true. But it was true of the Son of God. And the devil was deluded in thinking that Jesus Christ was not subject to the Father. Just because the devil wasn't subject, he thought no one else would be. Not only that, he questioned Jesus' estimate of the written Word of God. You know, it's interesting because... Uh, the devil put his own ambition before the Word of God. And he thought Jesus would do it also, but he was wrong. You say, what was the devil's ambition? <clears throat> Go to Isaiah and I'll show you. I'll show you his ambition. Isaiah chapter uh, 14, I believe it is. Is that what I want? Huh? Yeah, that's the one. Okay, 14. Let me find it here. Verse 12. Look at Isaiah 14, 12. Talking about the devil's ambition. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now, if you have a Bible that says anything other than Lucifer, you have an inferior Bible. Amen. Lucifer is the right word. It's the right word. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Do you know what the NIV does? Changes it. And these modern Bibles make this Jesus Christ, not the devil. Right. I'll show you in time. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will set up on the mount of the congregation in the side of the north. I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So here is the ambition of the devil. And uh, he failed in his estimate of Jesus Christ because he assumed that Christ would be ambitious. We hear much, boy, he's an ambitious young man, or she's an ambitious young lady. That might not be a compliment. It might not be. Not only that, he questioned our Lord's understanding of the Word of God. By suggesting this temptation to Christ, he demonstrated his ignorance of Christ. Jesus had perfect understanding of God's purpose in His Word. <coughs> Now he said, command this stone, these stones, to be made bread. The first thing about it, it seemed reasonable. Physically speaking, food was the need of the hour. And it appeared to be his greatest need at that hour. How Jesus could have reasoned, as I mentioned earlier with the devil, and this is just where you and I fail, we begin to reason about our needs. We conclude that our needs must be met. And we are tempted to act independently of God. And this was the temptation. You wonder what the temptation here is? It is to act independently of God. If you be the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. You're hungry, do it. The idea is like Joseph or like Esau selling his birthright for a mess of pottage. It's the same kind of temptation. The implication was you're going to die. You need to save yourself by feeding yourself. Now, had the Lord not believed the Word of God and obeyed the Word of God, He would have succumbed to the temptation. Now, it was possible when a temptation is reasonable, the danger is greater. But when it is available and within our reach, it's almost certain. However, the Lord teaches us that availability and feasibility do not mean that we should do it. Folks think green lights mean you ought to go through. They may on the highway, but they don't in God's work. Not always. Just because something is available and feasible doesn't mean that it's right. Amen. Doesn't mean it's right. And it may be wrong at that time, but right at another time, at a later, later time. Sometimes we need to wait. 
When I was a college student uh, three years into Bible college, pastoring a little church in Manning, Iowa, I loved that church. Had about 70 people out in the country town of Manning, maybe 2,000 people in the whole town, Iowa farm. I was, you know, uh, about as zealous as you could get about God and the Bible. And I had a little church pastoring it, and I told one of the deacons, a converted Lutheran, I said, you know, I think that I think I'm, the college is going to move and uh, to, from Omaha to Des Moines, and I think I'm just going to drop out of college and just pastor. And old Chris Thornton, he was a converted Lutheran. He said to me, Brother Blue, I wouldn't do that. You ought to finish college. And I felt a little bit rejected that he wasn't excited about me quitting college and do it. But you know, I'm so glad he gave me that advice. I'm glad he gave me that advice. That was not the right thing for me to do. You know what the right thing was? To finish. That was the right thing. I mean, who knows? Taking that, that might have been the end of me. See? And then after I went to Omaha or after I went to, to Pontiac, I was there a year in Dick Meyer, Open Door Baptist Church in, in uh, Wichita, Kansas, or Kansas City, Kansas, called me and said, I want you to come down and be my assistant pastor, the Open Door Baptist Church. Did you hear that name? Open Door Baptist Church. Amen. I called him back. I said, you know, I'm flattered that you would ask me, but I don't believe it's God's will for me to do it. See? Open doors and green lights don't always mean that you're supposed to go through them. They don't always mean that. Jesus had an open door. He had a need. He had the power. He had the opportunity. And he could have done it. He turned the water to wine and walked on the water, etc. He could have done this, but he didn't do it. He didn't do it. You say, you say, well, when's the right time? I don't know. I don't know. You'll have to work that out. I can't work that out for you. I heard about a fellow that drove all the way from Michigan to Jack to Florida to see Dr. Ruckman. He drove day and night. He came down, Dr. Ruckman sitting there barefooted. T-shirt on, German shepherd laying beside him, typing on a typewriter. Doorbell rings. Come in. He keeps typing. Rude, crude. You know, what do you want? He keeps typing. That's Dr. Ruckman. The guy comes. Doc, I need to talk to you for a minute. He said, talk. <laughs> Some of you, that, that, that ends you right there. He, kept, he just kept typing. He said, Doc, he said, I've driven day and night, all day and all night to come down to find out God's will for my life. He said, do I look like God? Just kept typing. <laughs> What's wrong with that? What's he supposed to do? You know why this kid drove day and night? He's trying to impress Dr. Ruckman. That's all he was doing. He's trying to impress him. He knew. He, he read this kid the moment he came in. I'm not impressed. I mean, a guy is stupid to drive that far to Dr. Ruckman to find out what the will of God is. Matter of fact, you'd be stupid to drive anywhere that far to find out what the will of God is. I tell you where you can find out what the will of God for your life is on your knees. I don't know what God's will for you is. I don't know what God's will for you is. I have a hard time knowing what it is for me. Amen. And that's the truth. You say, well, don't you think God wants you here? Well, I think he does. But I may be wrong. I bet if we voted some of you. <laughs> See? Why, sure. Sure, some of you would. So, I mean, if you're that confused on it, you don't expect me to be certain, you see. But if I thought it was somewhere else, I'd be there. I may find out after 24 years the devil has been deceiving me and making me think it's God's will that I'm here. I mean, God may have wanted me in the Philippines all this time, and I didn't know it. Hey, I don't know. I just believe this is where I ought to be, and this is where I'm going to be until I believe I need to be somewhere else. See? You know, we would really like for someone else to tell us what the will of God is so that if it doesn't work out, we can blame them. Hey, that's all it is. We want somebody else's fingerprints on our murder weapon. That's all we're after 90% of the time. Could you tell me God's will? Nope. Sure can't. Sure can't. Oh, I can tell you some things the Bible says. It's God's will you get saved. It's God's will you get baptized. It's God's will you yoke up with a local church. It's God's will that you witness. It's God's will that you tithe. Oh, you don't want to know God's will now, do you? It's God's will that you tithe. 
you know, it's God's will that you go to church. It's God's will that you live a holy life. It's God's will that you have good Christian friends. But those things are all written in the Bible. You don't need to ask me about those things, do you? But what color car you should buy? You know, what color carpet? Say, folks get together and say, well, we prayed about the pews, Pastor. We think, hey, don't waste my time. God didn't tell you what color they ought to be. I don't care how much you prayed. He didn't tell you what color. No, he didn't. What if you come to me and say, he said this, and I say, no, no, I prayed, and he said this. <laughs> one fellow came to Charles Spurgeon one time, and he said, Mr. Spurgeon, I've been praying, and God told me that I'm supposed to preach in your church. Charles Spurgeon says, well, when God tells me, I'll let you. <laughs> sure. You know how we play this spiritual game. Amen. It's a game we play, but we believe the game. That's the problem. The game is real to us. And our problem is we're too spiritual. Right. And so we want everybody to tell us, what's the will of God? What's the will of God? What's the will of God? And you know, we so rob ourselves by believing that God has zeroed in and said, God just wants me to be a babysitter for the rest of my life. You don't know that. You don't know that. And you cheat yourself. Now, he may want you to be one tonight, but this idea of the rest of your life, you don't know that. You don't even know what tomorrow brings forth. You don't know that. That's why James says, if you go into such and such a city, you should say, if the Lord wills. Say, I don't know, hey, I don't know what God's will for me tomorrow is. Now I've got some plans, and I hope God blesses them. <laughs> That's the truth. And I hope because I tell you the truth, I don't become your enemy, and you think less of me. But what I'm saying is true of all pastors. I don't care what they tell you. They do not have an edge on anything. Amen, amen. amen. They don't. They don't. Those guys put their dirty socks on and off just like you do. That's right. I'm telling you. I, you know, we, we've got to get over this thing of idolizing preachers and missionaries and evangelists. Amen. You know, if you knew how many of them have fallen into sin as I do, you, you'd get over it. And maybe that's why they're falling into sin. If we've put them, we and they have put them on pedestals. You know, you can't say anything. Don't touch the Lord's anointed. Why, every child is God's anointed. You know, the man of God is coming into the pulpit. And the guy's shacking up somewhere, you know. You know, has 57 people or 100 people to walk the aisle at the end of the invitation. And you think it's the power of God. That's what folks think. And the sad thing about it, the guy in the pulpit thinks it's the power of God because people come forward. That's the delusion. That's the delusion. Why? If the power of God is people coming forward, Benny Hinn and Jimmy Swaggart, Jimmy Swaggart is ahead of any fundamental Baptist preacher. Why don't you and I wake up to this situation? Crowd psychology does not mean that the power of God is on you. You see, this idea that you hear these reports of people going to different third world countries and having thousands saved, that's a bunch of junk. You should, have seen, you should have been with those Filipino pastors over there if you think thousands are being saved. Why, those dear Filipino pastors are struggling to have 70 people in Sunday school. But you see, that won't sell you can't market that. You have to bring back a report to where you can raise some money. You understand what I'm saying here? Are we, are we on the same wavelength here tonight? All right. So the devil uh, tempted Jesus Christ and he showed his own ignorance because he questioned our Lord's understanding of the Word of God. And by suggesting this temptation to Christ, he, the devil, demonstrated his own ignorance of the person of Christ. Jesus had perfect understanding of the will of God and his word. I do not, nor do you. Now, the reply of our Lord is found in verse 4. And he answered and said, it is written. Now, folks, that's important. Do you see that? He said, it is written. If you went back to chapter 3 in the book of Matthew, Jesus Christ has just been baptized. 
At his baptism, John said, I saw the Spirit of God descend on him like a dove and lighted upon him. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son. In the very next chapter, the devil says, If you be the son of God. Jesus could have said, Why, it was just confirmed yesterday at my baptism. I heard a voice from heaven. There was a visible sign of a Holy Spirit descending. There's no question about it. But I'm telling you this. Jesus did not appeal to his experience or his revelation. You know what Jesus appealed to? The written word of God. Now you better get that. That is so important. Because we've got too many people looking at their experiences and their revelations for confirmation when they ought to be looking at the written word of God. I'm telling you what, you can put any interpretation on your experiences and your revelations. But people can check on you when it comes to the book. I was down at Costco some time ago. My son Randy worked down there in a hot dog stand. <laughs> anyway, that's funny. Anyway, he worked. <laughs> I just drive by and I'd say, how you doing there, son? <laughs> Make fun of him. I know I'm warped. <laughs> I know. You know. But my kind, we have a lot of fun. Anyway, I was down there one day standing, leaning on my hot dog stand, talking to him. And this guy came up to me. He'd been in our church a few times. I, I'd know him if I saw him, but I don't know his name. And I'm sure he's a good guy. That's not even my point. He, he probably had better character than I do. But anyway, we shook hands, and I noticed that he had a deformed hand when I shook hands with him. And I remembered when he'd been at the church, same thing. Nice guy, so on, but he didn't like my preaching. And that means he's not saved, but he didn't, he didn't like my preaching. And the truth is, he was of the charismatic persuasion. And we were talking, and he said, uh, first thing he said to me, he said, he said Pastor Blue, he said, um, uh, I had a vision the other night, I was dreaming, and he said, I was dreaming that there was an earthquake in San Francisco. And he said, the buildings were swaying and falling and people were screaming and dying. And he said, I, I woke up in a sweat. I sat up in the bed and I looked over and my clock was flashing 12-12. And he said, I don't, that's the truth. He said, and I, I don't know if God was trying to tell me that it's going to happen, if it's going to happen the 12th of December or not. I said to him, I said, well, brother... God told me that all of the cities are going to have an earthquake. Amen. They are. The book of Revelation says that there's such a mighty earthquake that all the great cities of the earth fell. Well, when I told him the Bible said it, he just turned and walked off. He wasn't interested. See, he wanted me to be impressed with his dream. That's what he wanted. He wanted me to be impressed that he had had a dream. But when I gave him the scripture, it had, he had no interest in it. Right, right. Now you ought to figure that out and think about that for a while. Say, Jesus Christ answered from the written word of God. And uh, he said, it is written. He did not appeal to this recent revelation. He appealed to the Old Testament writings. He said, it is written, and that must always be our appeal. We must stay with the Scripture. But listen to me, you can't stay with the Scripture if somebody's taken them away from you. That's right. See? Not only that, his appeal to the Scripture was according to the present need. You know, the devil wanted him to believe that the greatest need was for him to act now, and if he didn't have food, he could not complete God's purpose in his life. The devil wanted Jesus to believe that the greatest need in his life at that moment was food. But I'm telling you, the greatest need in the life of Jesus Christ was not food. The greatest need was to obey his Father.